I must speak of the transit of the slaves in the West Indies. This, I confess, in my own opinion, is the most wretched part of the whole subject. So much misery condensed in so little room is more than the human imagination had ever before conceived. On a warm summer's day in 1759, a baby was born in Yorkshire, England. The parents were a wealthy merchant and his wife, Robert and Elizabeth. I will not accuse the Liverpool merchants. I will allow them, nay, I will believe them to be men of humanity. The child was small and sickly, often being described as delicate, and had many physical ailments along with poor eyesight. I verily believe, therefore, if the wretchedness of any one of the many hundred Negroes stowed in each ship could be brought before their view and remain within the sight of the African merchant, there is no one among them whose heart would bear it. In 1767, the boy began attending Hull Grammar School, and during this time became lifelong friends with the young headmaster, Joseph Milner. Let anyone imagine to himself six or seven hundred of these wretches chained two by two surrounded with every object that is nauseous and disgusting, diseased and struggling under every kind of wretchedness? How can we bear to think of such a scene as this? The boy profited from the atmosphere at the school until the death of his father in 1768. With the boy's father gone, the mother, struggling to cope, shipped the nine-year-old boy off to live with his prosperous aunt and uncle in London, where he was to attend boarding school. When I consider the magnitude of the subject which I am to bring before the house, a subject in which the interests, not of this country, nor of Europe alone, but of the whole world and of posterity are involved. Because of his relative's influence, especially that of his philanthropist aunt, he became interested in evangelical Christianity. His staunchly Church of England conservative parents, alarmed at his turn to nonconformist ways and leanings to evangelicalism, brought the 12-year-old boy home. He was heartbroken by the separation from his aunt and uncle, but his parents refused to allow him to return to the school because the headmaster had become a Methodist. When I think, at the same time, on the weakness of the advocate who has undertaken this great cause, when these reflections press upon my mind, it is impossible for me not to feel both terrified and concerned at my own inadequacy to such a task. The boy continued his education at nearby Poplington School from 1771 to 1776. Initially, he resisted the Methodist ways, as he grew older, his religious fervor diminished. He embraced theater going and attended large balls and parties. When I turn myself to these thoughts, I take courage. I determine to forget all my other fears, and I march forward with a firmer step in the full assurance that my cause will bear me out. At the age of 17, after the deaths of his grandfather and uncle, the boy began attending St. John's College of Cambridge. Because of the magnificent wealth left to him by his relatives, he was not inclined to apply himself to his studies, and instead immersed himself in the social aspects of college. He pursued a lifestyle of late-night drinking, gambling, cards, and parties, though he found that some of the company he kept under these circumstances to be distasteful and unpleasant. I shall be able to justify upon the clearest principles every resolution in my hand, the avowed of, and of which is the total abolition of the slave trade. I wish exceedingly, in the outset, to guard both myself and the house from entering into the subject with any sort of passion. Witty, generous, and an excellent conversationalist, the boy, now a young man, made many friends, one in particular the future Prime Minister William Pitt, and was popular wherever he went. Despite his frivolous lifestyle, he managed to pass his examinations and was awarded a Bachelor of Arts, and later a Master of Arts. It is not their passions I shall appeal to, I ask only for their cool and impartial reason. I mean not to accuse anyone, but to take the shame upon myself, in common, indeed, with the whole of Parliament of Great Britain, for having suffered this horrid trade to be carried out under their authority. He began his political degree while still at university, encouraged by his friend Pitt to obtain a seat in Parliament. Succeeding after spending tremendous amounts of money, he sat as an independent, resolving to be a no-party man. He was the MP for Yorkshire and had great influence, even over men who did not share his religious views. We are all guilty. We ought to plead guilty. The slaves who are sometimes described as rejoicing at their captivity are so wrung with misery at leaving their country that it is the constant practice to set sail at night, lest they be sensible of their departure. 
Four years later, he embarked on a tour of Europe, which would change his life forever. The situation of the slaves has been described by Mr. Norris, one of the Liverpool delegates, in a manner which I am sure will convince the House how interest can draw a film across the eyes so thick that total blindness could do no more and how it is our duty, therefore, to trust not to the reasonings of interested men, or to their way of colouring a transaction. That February, he returned to the United Kingdom to support Pitt's proposals for parliamentary reforms. Following, he continued his travels throughout Europe, all the while reading The Rise and Progress of Religion in the Soul, by Philip Doddridge, a leading early 18th century English nonconformist. From here, it is said that William Wilberforce's spiritual journey began. He began to read the Bible and pray, undergoing evangelical conversion, letting go of his past life and resolving to commit his future life and work to the service of God. In 1787, he startled his contemporaries by producing a book that contrasted greatly with the commonly prevailing views of Christianity at the time. At the time, religious enthusiasm was looked on as social transgression and was generally frowned upon in society. This led him to become what is known as a classical liberal, believing in religious and social freedom, and that people should be treated with equal respect. As soon as ever I had arrived thus far in my investigation of the slave trade, I confess to you, sir, so enormous, so dreadful, so in irremediable, did this wickedness appear that my own mind was completely made up for this abolition. A trade carried on as this was must be abolished. Let the Polish policy be what it might, let the consequences be what they would. I from this time determined that I would never rest till I had effected its abolition. His involvement with the slave trade and exports was brief but impacting, and led him all the way back to Parliament, where he was to deliver his famous abolition speech, demanding that people take responsibility for their actions, treat others with the respect they deserve, and ultimately free the people.